What's up, team? Welcome back to the 73rd episode of the Athletes Podcast featuring Justin Rothling Schofer. Today we got Freddie here to get you to subscribe, like the video, that'd be great. But we dive deep. He's a strength and conditioning coach for previous NHL teams, and now he is the founder and owner of Own It, an incredible company that's helping executives, CEOs, athletes, high performers become the best that they can possibly be. This is the 73rd episode of the Athletes Podcast. I hope you enjoy. What's up, Justin? How are we doing, guys? Doing well, man. How about yourself? You cannot complain whatsoever. Yeah, you got a nice background. Look at that. Not a bad place to get jump on a Zoom call. <laughs> it's uh, it's nice to be uh, be able to be outside and uh, enjoy the a little bit of heat. That's for sure. Yeah, I mean, sun's out, guns out. You're ready to go, right? Always, always. <laughs> Stupid not. Well, to- yeah, exactly. You got to flaunt if you got it. You got to flaunt it, right? Uh, so first of all, appreciate you coming on the athletes podcast, man. It means a lot. I'm uh, looking forward to diving into who Justin, I believe I'm going to try and say it, Rothling Schaffer. You got it. Nice. Look at that. One for one. I won't try and say it again. <laughs> uh, so uh, let's just dive into it. You good to go? I'm good to go if you are. So. Take us through who Justin is and how you came to be this strength and conditioning coach that's worked in the NHL for years. You're now founder of Own It. And you basically have created this platform that you use through the through the power of data and are now just helping athletes, CEOs, executives excel in their positions. Just dive into it. Who created this what you are about and how you've come to be this pretty incredible individual i i appreciate that and uh i I think that for me the biggest thing was um, it happened at 13 years old where i started to realize that hey there's a better way to do things and i um, i always wanted to be obviously playing the nhl as a as a player and um i still remember looking around at everybody else that was around me at 13 years old saying, Hey, everybody's good. Everybody's talented. Everybody can play. What's going to differentiate us. And I knew right away that consistency and being able to perform at a high level day in and day out was the only thing that was going to basically separate myself. I did not have incredible skill. I did not have incredible size. I did not have anything that would differentiate me other than a work ethic and that ability to be consistent. And so I was like, okay, great. Consistency is awesome, but how do you do it? And so I started to experiment, um, everything from nutrition to sleep, to hydration, to you name it. And so at 13 years old, I was wearing heart rate monitors. I was, had little data devices on my head, measuring brainwaves when I slept. I, I was monitoring what I was eating, how much I was drinking, how I felt, the energy levels, and ultimately the way I performed. And lo and behold, at the end of the day, that consistency is what allowed me to make it as far in my hockey career as I did. Um, and I, I, I fell in love with it. I got a right through my college hockey career. It put me into uh, a kinesiology and nutrition undergrad degree. And then uh, as I signed my American League uh, deal. Um, uh, I it, invested my money that I had made there into uh, getting a master's degree. And then my master's degree was then, uh, when I retired, was then covered and uh, then started some PhD work and continued to develop this understanding that data is nothing more than information and a guide to how we apply it in our lives. And if we don't apply it, it's like any type of conference or book you read, a conference you go to, book you read, whatever, information will not get us anywhere unless we apply it. And mm-hmm. that's what's happening right now in, in the health and wellness industry so much is that we have all this information, but yet we have no idea how to apply it. And if it was just about information, we'd all be billionaires with six packs, but we know that's not the case. Mm-hmm. And from that, I was able to create um, a system for athletes and when I went uh, and got my, uh, was the director at uh, sport performance at uh, Miami, Ohio. And then from there, uh, started to do some consulting work with some NHL clubs, the Columbus Blue Jackets and the Washington Capitals, and then got my first full-time 
position uh, where I was in the league with uh, with Anaheim. And so over the course of those 12 years uh, with four different teams and organizations, I started to say, hey, you know what, this this makes a lot of sense. Um, and we uh, won national championships. We uh, uh, went deep in playoff runs. We put, I think, over 15 guys to the National Hockey League in, in three years at Miami. Um, and, and we just start to see this level of resilience, this level of success, and ultimately that level of consistency um, that truly matters at the uh, at that, that at that athletic realm. Um, and uh, so I ended up writing three books on this topic and how I ended up getting into the a kind of executive uh, and CEO space was um, uh, somebody had read, read my book and I got a call from a major company that uh, a lot of people would, would know the name. Uh, they're based, uh, they were based up in Seattle. And um, they said, hey, would you be willing to do a talk for our, for our team and our company? And I said, yeah, no problem. So I talked all about this level of consistency, knowing your data, knowing what to apply when. All these tools that are in, around us are great tools, but they're not great for all of us all the time. And uh, they said, this was amazing. Can you work with our executive team um, on a, a for for the year? And I said, well, I, in the back of my head, I'm like, I work with hockey players. <laughs> yeah, I don't work with executives. I, I don't know what to do. And uh, it started to it dawn on me that hey, the executive, the corporate, the entrepreneur is looking for the same thing. They're looking for how can they be more consistent? How can they have more energy? How can they sell better? How can they be better versions of who they are for a longer period of time so that ultimately they make more money? Mm -hmm. and, and that's what it comes down to and, and live a more enjoyable life. And so needless to say, I took the, took the role, took the job, and that led to my exit out of the NHL in 2019 as a regular everyday guy. And uh, from there, have navigated into into own it, which uh, which I own with uh, with my fiance as well. Yeah, I okay. So many points I want to touch on. The first being born and raised in Edmonton. Are you an Oilers fan? I am an Oilers fan, definitely. Okay, okay. So you're slightly disappointed at the fact they've been shut out two games in a row now to the Leafs. Yes, the uh, they were on a, a great tear there for a while, and uh, you know what? They still look really good. They're young, they're fast, they're talented, but. Uh, they have been blanked two nights in a row and uh, Austin Matthews, even without Austin Matthews, but um, <laughs> yes, it's, it's not ideal. It's been, a, it come, let's be honest, it's been, it's been winter in Edmonton in terms of the Oilers for, uh, uh, for a long time. The 06, even though they went to the cup final, was still a uh, anomaly, let's put it that way. Yeah, and they, man, they brought it, they were close there against Carolina in 06, but uh Needless to say, they've been, it's been a struggle being an Oilers fan. I'm a Canucks fan, so I'm in a similar position. Haven't really had much success other than uh, a couple of President's Trophies. But again, Game 7 wasn't our favor as well. So uh, let's, let's touch on you as an athlete first before we kind of dive into who you are now and what you've become. Love to kind of get a bit of insight background on, you know, you start studying at 13 years old, you start reading books while your friends are playing video games, becoming a student of the game, trying to identify ways in which you can get better, become more of a quote unquote high performer in comparison to, to your competition. What was kind of the, that turning point for you? Why at 13 did you decide, Hey, I, I'm going to get better. And what was the reason behind it? Like there's gotta be some, some specific point that made you, kind of have a reality check. You ever been in a situation where your pants got wet? Look at that, no big deal. The only pant, Fabletics Men. Check out this training day tee from Fabletics Men. Unbelievable comfort, anti-stink technology, mesh sidings for increased ventilation and anti-chafing technology. Incredible product. I'm wearing this shirt all the time. It's my favorite. Head over to fabletics.com backslash the AP for all their products and some exciting discounts. What had at 13 years old when everybody was um, playing video games, they're yeah. like, they're distracted. You're hyper focused on becoming the best athlete that you can be. Yeah. Yeah. So I think to be honest with you, it was, I mean, I can still pinpoint the night where um, I had come home from uh, a game. We had uh, we'd been in a tournament in uh, in Calgary, 
and we ended up losing in the championship game on the other team. I mean, Jonathan Tapes was on the other team, uh, on the team that won. Um, uh, it was, it was that type of, like, that was the, the kids we were playing around and mm -hmm. it just, it, on the drive home, my dad said something to me. He goes, uh, cause I asked him, I was like, what do I need to do to be, to be better? What do I need to do to, to get better? Like I, I was, I've always had this obsession for getting better this obsession for taking another step forward. And it, it, it's not that I wasn't happy for the successes in which I had or uh, the things that came out well, but I knew that if it was going to be something that I was going to become great in, that I continually need to look at the failures. And so my dad said something to me on the way home. He goes, uh, son, talent gets you noticed, but consistency gets you paid. And that's something that I just always took to heart. And that level, that, that word consistency is what I've continued to strive for every single day is how can I be more consistent? Because he's right. Like, no matter what arena you're choosing, whether it be athletics, whether it be business, whether it be family, whether it be uh, a relationship, that the, the talent of, hey, I, I'm a really good father. I have the talent to be a really good father. But if you're only a good father once every 10 days or three days a month. I mean, that's not, that's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the business. Uh, if, if you're, if you've got a you're great entrepreneurial spirit, but four days a week, you're working hard on your business and your focus. And the other three, you're just being whatever you want to be, then it, it's not going to be successful. And so that's what I really took out of that. And it, drove me to figure out how can I be the most consistent version of myself. And it really came down to what now through science and through all the studying that and, and experience and coursework and self-work and self-development and mentors that both Elise and I have worked with, deduce it down to both the inner and outer energy um, that I'm sure that we'll get into uh, a little bit later here. But that, that's, that's what really drove me to spend time in the books and read and develop um, that level of understanding because I knew it would directly parlay over into my ultimate success at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. yeah, let's dive into that inner versus outer energy and have you elaborate a bit more on that because it's such an interesting topic and I think you, you're you going to be able to articulate it better than most. Yeah, so when we look at anything, um, and, and I'll, I'll break it into two different groups. So in business, what do you need to do in business to, in order to stay afloat? It, it, make money. Exactly. Make money. So that means that you're selling something. Mm -hmm. you, ha you have to sell something, whether it's a product, whether it's a service, whether it's yourself, you have to sell something. But people don't buy just anything. They have to have this emotional connection with you. Mm -hmm. They have to have this intellectual connection with you. And so... There's studies done by NYU, Stanford, Harvard, all talking about this emotional and intellectual connection that happens. So if somebody has an emotional connection to you, the probability they're going to buy from you increases 87%. Okay. And the way in which people go through this is the first thing they're going to do is they're going to say, hey, do I like this person? Do I trust this person? Do I buy with their energy? If the answer is yes, boom. 87% more likely to purchase. Then what wow. happens is it goes to the intellectual quotient, which they say, hey, do I justify what I'm purchasing here? Now it goes back to the emotional side. If they have an emotional connection to you, the likelihood that they can justify it in their head, cha-ching. How many mm -hmm. times have you gone to uh, a, I, I tell this story all the time, but my fiance and I, we went to Napa and we went into these wine tastings and there was one in particular we we're like we're gonna love this place so great reviews we had so many people telling us about it we went in there our experience was terrible they mm. the, the the wine was good the wine was great but the the people showing that to us were like they, they they weren't really busy but they just weren't interested in like connecting with us and bringing the energy mm -hmm. and we ended up walking out we didn't buy anything we went into another place just off the whim we went in, the lady was like hugging us. She was all like excited. She was like talking to us about the, telling us about the wines. 
where they came from, giving us different tastings, giving us the history and everything else. Well, lo and behold, we dropped $2,500 and now we're on their wine club and we get wine every couple of days or every couple of months, pardon me. And I was so, going to say that's aggressive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so it's not that that wine was that much better, mm-hmm. but it's that we had that connection. And that's the key to selling anything is making that emotional and intellectual connection through the energies in which you're operating. So that is, that's, that's that on that side. Now, when it comes down to performance, it all comes down to the energy of which you're putting forward from uh, both the way you think and the way you feel. And so that's where the inner and outer energy comes in. Mm-hmm. The outer energy has everything to do with things physically. There are seven factors that we talk about. Nutrition, hydration, exercise or training, sleep, stress management, immune function, and environment or ecosystem. Mm-hmm. And we utilize HRV to understand the impact that all of those things are having on ourselves. And HRV stands for heart rate variability. It's the mm-hmm. number one most consistent, most in, uh, individualized metric of stress on the body because our body can't tell the difference between physical, emotional, spiritual, um, physical, spiritual, emotional, or psychological stress. It just sees it as stress, one response, and that's going to cause that HRV to drop. And so if we know which one of those seven categories is causing an issue, then we, on the outer energy piece, can make the habit change so that we can be more consistent day in and day out. On the inner energy side, think about mindset. It's the way we think, the way we communicate, the way we talk, the uh, the frameworks of which we believe things. And it brings this level of awareness. And so Elise has created a seven level of energy um, scale, bottom two being catabolic, meaning breaking down negative energy, uh, mm-hmm. conflict oriented energy, stress related energy, to the top five being anabolic energies. So building up positive win win scenarios, uh, yeah. consciousness. And if we can identify how to bring ourselves into that higher anabolic level of energy, well, all of a sudden, again, we can sell anything, we can perform at any time that we want, we can simply turn it on. And it becomes the way in which we operate on a regular basis. And so the synergies of both inner and outer energy comes back to getting into that parasympathetic state, that rest digest state, that optimal performance state that we look for day in and day out on a very consistent basis. So how, and I'm going through listening as I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around these different factors that influence these two states. What are some things that people can do? Because I'm basically our, my goal here with the athletes podcast and what our team is trying to do is educate the next generation of athletes. Yeah. So for me, this is a, an amazing interview because I think this is going to provide a lot of value to a lot of young athletes who are going to be able to come through, listen to an individual like yourself who normally they wouldn't have access to. And that's what, you know, Zoom has been able to do for us now is connect people online. You and I connected via Clubhouse. So I, I'm curious where and what specific things you would suggest for an athlete to do to to make sure that they're, those two sides are performing and that you're constantly progressing and making sure that they're filled up and you've got that energy so that you can sell what, what would you suggest? Absolutely. So I'll, I'll kind of just do, deduce it down to those eight areas. So mm-hmm. a seven on the inner or a seven on the outer and one on the inner. So if we were to break it down on the outer, number one being exercise or training. If it's, again, make it that you're setting intentional time for yourself to train one hour a day. Put it on the calendar, make it there. Whether that training is a yoga session, whether that training is a weight training session, whether that is a group exercise class, whether that is a um, uh, skill. Walking the dog. Whatever it may be, it's, it's focused, intentional activity, exercise training. Okay, right. that's number one. Nutritionally. Like again, with a lot of what we do, we do DNA, epigenetic testing, really dive deep into like the biomarkers that affect for us. But from an overarching side, it's a simple three, two, one rule. Okay. So we want to have three meals a day. We want to have two pieces of fruit a day. We want to have one big salad a day. If we stick to those general parameters, 
it's going to eliminate a lot of the crap that we're putting into our body and ultimately the way in which our body facilitates and functions. And whether we're looking to lose weight, gain weight, um, stay the same, but just be more optimally functioning. If we can get those pillars in place, then we can start getting more specific into the supplementation and the, uh, the higher levels, the like higher levels on a pyramid that truly are going to, again, affect smaller percentages of things. But if we don't have the bottom pillars, those three things, Mm -hmm. we're not going to be in a, a place to, to optimize anything. The next one is hydration. And our body is made up of 75% water. Our brain, our lungs, and our heart are made up of 85% water. So if we are dehydrated by 1%, we can imagine the impact that's going to have on our body. So we need to make sure that we're getting half our body weight in ounces every single day. So half our body weight in ounces every single day. That, again, is another actionable takeaway. Number four, when we come into sleep, this is by far the most important one, by far the most loaded. But again, how do we get better sleep? And if we were to come in and, and it's not the quantity of sleep that matters, but the quality. And so when we talk about quality of sleep, we're wanting to talk about 35 full 90 minute cycles every single night, or sorry, every single week, pardon me. Okay. And if we break that down, that's five, on average, five full cycles every night. So on average, seven and a half hours every single night. So if we're planning our sleeping uh, times and our wake times, we can now base it upon the cycles in which we're going through. Mm -hmm. So if we need to wake up at 6.30, we count back seven and a half hours, which would bring us to uh, 11, uh, 11 p.m. is the time that we need to be sleeping. And if we time our sleep cycles like that, we will thus be waking up at the very end of a sleep cycle and optimizing the quality of sleep in which we're getting. We will not wake up groggy, we'll wake up energized, we'll wake up again in a much more fluid state. And so again, 35 cycles per week on average, that means five cycles per average per night, seven and a half hours. And that is how we gauge our wake up and sleep time. So we don't wanna say, oh yeah, I'm gonna get eight hours of sleep, I'm gonna get nine hours of sleep, I'm gonna get uh, 7.25 hours of sleep. We try to make it so that again, it's right in that seven and a half hours to optimize that sleep cycle. Number five, we come into stress management and we should all be giving ourselves at least a 10 to 15 minute window once a day in which we're focusing on our breath, we're going for a walk, we're meditating, we're doing some type of yoga flow, something to bring our, to center ourselves. And ideally it happens between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. That's okay. gonna reset our cortisol melatonin cycle as best for us throughout the day because that's the natural time that we have a natural lull in that cortisol or energy throughout the day. So between 10 and two, 15 minute window where we can really truly optimize the way in which um, we're showing up. Breath work, meditation, yoga flow, something like that. Number six, when we come to immune function, this is where we want to be focused on that HRV that I was talking about. And you can measure that through a uh, heart rate monitor, through your whoop Apple strap. Watch, your Whoop strap, your Aura Ring, Whoop, uh, Polar, uh, Fitbit, you name it. Everything measures HRV now, and you need to get consistent with that. But if you see a three-day downtrend in HRV, it means that our immune system is compromised in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't mean we're getting sick but it means that our body is under stress and thus because it's putting attention towards the area that's creating stress, we need to help support our immune function. So without having the DNA test, without knowing what we need, simple fallback, echinacea, zinc, vitamin D and tart cherry juice. Tart cherry juice helps with the met metabolization and um, uh, uptake of the vitamin D. So okay. that's kind of the, the takeaway for immune function. And then environment, comes back to just being present and knowing, hey, what's around me? Is my bed made? Is my room I'm operating in messy? Am I getting outside and seeing the sunshine first thing in the morning? Am I uh, in front of a laptop and screen all day? Am I ex having a lot of blue light pollution after the sun goes down? All of these things that we can start to say, hey, what am I doing that's either optimizing or not optimizing my environment? And so those are the seven areas in that outer energy space that truly helps us. And that, like, that's the energy that we like feel like right. um, when we're going through it. Now on the inner energy side, it's that level of awareness to 
any stimulus that comes at us and the way in which we choose to show up. So for example, if we have, for, for any stimulus, so say if I, was, if I was late coming to this uh, interview, you're sitting on the other side, maybe a little bit panicky going, ah, is he gonna show up? Is he not gonna show up? I don't know what's gonna happen. Well, that's energy being put in a place that's gonna be draining for you. Whereas you could go through three things. You can become aware of how you're feeling. You can allow that feeling to be there. I, I'm just gonna allow it, it's fine. It's okay, it's not right or wrong. You acknowledge the space in which you're in and the choices that you have, and then you take action. So you're being proactive rather than reactive to every stimulus that's going on. Same thing on my side, if I actually was running late, I would show up maybe being like frazzled, being like, God, I'm late, I'm sorry. I, now I can't collect my thoughts, I can't communicate effectively. But instead, you know what guys, I apologize, I'm late. We're here, I've got a little bit of time after, let's make sure that this, this can be done in a uh, more effective way. So I, first I paused. So I was acknowledged or um, being aware of what was going on around me. That pause, there's magic in that pause. You allowed yourself to feel the way you're feeling. Cause again, it's not right or wrong. You acknowledge that it's there and then you choose and you take action in a more proactive way, productive way, something that's gonna put you in that better energy space. And so by combining those two, you all of a sudden become a powerhouse in anything that comes your way because it can be negative, it can be positive, but you're moving in that right direction uh, no matter what. And I'll give another example for uh, from an athletic side. You go out and have a bad shift. You can come to the bench, you can slam your stick, you can uh, throw your gloves, you can uh, come off the bench if you're in basketball and uh, hit the chair in football, you can kick the sideline, you can throw your helmet, whatever it may be. Or you can come off, you can acknowledge, hey, I, <laughs> I wasn't at my best, like, that's not me. Take a breath, pause, allow that you're feeling this way. Acknowledge that, hey, that's not who I am. Acknowledge what you did wrong. And then take action and go out, go out and act in a different way. Tom Brady does it, it is the best that you've ever seen do it. Sidney Crosby, Alexander Ovechkin, Ryan Getzlaff, these guys all do this and they all do it at a very high level, which is why you're able to see, and I don't know if anybody remembers, at the World Juniors, mm -hmm. 2000, 2007, where Marc-Andre Fleury came out, played the puck, shot it off Dion Phaneuf's ass, and it went into the net and they lost the gold medal game. That was the goal that lost them the gold medal game. Mm -hmm. Well, that could have absolutely decimated Marc-Andre Fleury's career. It could have. Mm -hmm. And now we're talking like big scale here. Yeah. But he, and again, in the, in the interview after, this is, he literally went through these steps. He goes, he acknowledged what was going on. He was aware of what was going on because yeah, had that, that, that happened. I, I, I feel terrible. He allowed himself. He wasn't laughing and smiling. He allowed himself to feel it. Allow yourself to be there. Then he acknowledged what went on. And then all of a sudden he was drafted by the Pittsburgh Penguins first overall. And now he's a three time, four time Stanley cup winner. And quite arguably one of the best goaltenders in the league over the last decade. Yeah. And so by simply going through those four steps, you operate and you become this resilient, relentless, consistent player when you do this over and over and over again. And this, this sequence of four A's, I probably go through 30, 40 times a day wow. where anything that happens to me, it's what I go through. Mm. If Elise came out to me and yelled at me right now, I wouldn't turn around and like yell at her and go, what? Or if somebody on the other end, I get an email that says, hey, um, we uh, have a problem with, uh, with our billings account. I wouldn't go, oh my God. I take a breath, go, okay, this sucks. <laughs> it doesn't make it any more, it doesn't make it any less shitty. Mm -hmm. This sucks. How are we gonna act on it? How are we gonna go in and, and, and move on this? And all of a sudden, as a leader, that power of what you portray out to everybody else all of a sudden allows everybody else's level of play to level up as well. And that is why 
in in their team setting and our in our corporation setting when we're working with companies like Heinz, BMW, uh, um, Sub Zero, you name it, the, it it changes the way in which they show up on a day to day basis because the leadership group can do that. Thus, it filters down to the the rest of the executive team. That's a re- goes down to the directors, thus it goes down to everybody who's working under them. And that is mm-hmm. the culture that's thus created. And it's taught from both the business and the athlete side uh, yeah. of what we're doing. And so that's the way the inner and outer energies truly combine and the takeaways in, the, uh, in which they can have. So many takeaways there. I really hope that for those who are listening, jotted down, brought their notepad out, took down some notes. Uh, I know I'll be revisiting it, that's for sure. I want to touch on a couple specific points. HRV, that's one that you're super focused on. I know that there's issues with the wearables and maybe not being as accurate. Calorie count, for sure, we know is just a guessing game on their part but how or is there a specific one that you recommend do you recommend wearing two so that you can kind of take an average or let dive into a bit of that like what where hrv is how people can apply it yeah i love i love that you bring this up this is such this is like right up my alley um great question so thank you for myself i've got five where i'm actually doing it in the middle of an experiment right now and I, again what do they say? Tim Ferriss, Tool of Titans, the number one thing that most successful people do is they self-experiment. They learn. They use their self as case studies. And so right now I've got the Aura Ring. I've got the Whoop Band. I've got um, a polar mo- polar strap in which I wear and then the bio, um, uh, the bio strap. Mm-hmm. So those are, the, those are the four in which I'm wearing. And then I use BioForce HRV, which is the fifth one. And... What I've been doing is I've been tracking every single workout in which I do with all of these. And obviously the, the heart rate chest strap is your gold standard. That's number one. And so did my workout this morning. It's fresh in my mind so I can tell you. Heart rate strap gave me a caloric expenditure of 747. It was an hour and eight minutes long. Uh, it was high intensity intermittent uh, training and the peak heart rate was 177, average heart rate was 140, and then it gave me a, a strain load as well. Well, between the other four wearables I had, I had a chlorical expenditure of 420, I had a chlorical expenditure of like 510, I had a chloric expenditure of 910. So it, there's a difference of like four or 500 calories. Like that is, that to me is unacceptable to begin with. Mm-hmm. Then when you take a look at heart rate, which truly is like impactful and you come back and you say, okay, peak heart rate of which was 177 uh, and average of 140 on the heart rate strap. The others had me at 167, 172, 158, I think was the worst one with an average of somewhere in that 132 to 141 range. Okay. So the average wasn't bad, but the peaks were not there. So it comes back to like shit in equals shit out. And if you have gra- crappy data coming in, you're going to get crappy stuff coming out at the back end. Mm-hmm. And even if you're, people are going to say, well, it's just about making sure you're measuring consistently. Okay, well, you want consistently crappy data, then <laughs> great. That's, um, that's awesome. And so at the end of the day, why are we even utilizing a lot of these wearables to measure our fitness and our exercise? Because it does not make sense. If we're not going to measure with a heart rate strap, why are we doing it? It, it, at this point, it still does not make sense because something coming from your wrist, something coming from your fingers, something coming from your ear, something, it, it, it is not, it's not working. It's not pulling the quality of information that we need. Now, the most interesting fact about this was that when I took a look at our, my HRVs over the last, even call it week, between the top three, the Aura Ring, the Whoop Band, and the um, heart rate monitor, my HRV separated by about one to two every single wow. time. 
So extremely accurate in HRV readings. Why? Because they're taking it at the deepest level of sleep when you're, and it's a snapshot of when you're truly laying there at truly at rest. Mm. And remember, we started at saying at the beginning, your body does not know the difference between mental, physical, spiritual, or emotional stress. So all of a sudden, when we come back and we take a look at all the exercise you do throughout the day or that you don't do throughout the day, all the, uh, we don't have a measure for, or, or a device or an app to measure how stressed we are at work or how stressed we are about our exam coming up or our business opportunity we have. But yet our HRV reflects that. So the same thing happens with our fitness. Same thing happens with our exercise. If it's a really hard day, our heart, our body is going to know, and thus it's going to be reflected in our HRV. So there's mm -hmm. no purpose in tracking all this garbage to figure out what we need from a calorical expenditure intake to all of this other stuff. Because if we are doing it the right way and we're just simply focusing on those little habits that I mentioned in those seven areas of outer energy and, and using HRV as our gauge and our guide, we are going to be able to create the change and the effectiveness that we truly need to at the end of the day. Right. Yeah, it was interesting. I woke up this morning and I checked my recovery and I was down at like 44%. I'm like, what the hell? I felt like I had a great sleep. I didn't know what was going on and had a workout yesterday that wasn't too strenuous, right? But I thought, oh, I felt pretty good. And it's interesting when you start breaking down those other factors, you start looking back, you're like, oh yeah, I was pretty stressed out about that. Oh, maybe I ate a little too late. There's just so many different things that go into it, right? So super interesting information. You touched on your yeah. training. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say uh, on, on top of that, what is, what is unique is, uh, and, and this was something that I think is important to know is because a lot of this can be affected through manual change. So it, it's simply done through algorithms. Mm. So if your whoop band or your aura ring or your bio strap, all of a sudden see you as waking up in the middle of the night because you had to go pee and then it doesn't put you back to sleep or it changes the quality, the quantity of sleep, it's going to give you a lower recovery score. Case in point, we had uh, uh, an executive um, owns the biggest uh, conglomerate in uh, North America of fruit trees by, um, uh, of all odd things in which you're, you're into, but, um, but I mean, super cool company. Yeah. But um, anyways, he was, uh, he called me and he goes, Justin, this is the third day in a row. Like my HRV and my um, recovery has been like 12%, 14%. And I looked, I was like, well, like we're getting like four, three and four hours of sleep at night. Like what's going on? He's like, no, I've been sleeping for like seven or eight. And so, but what he was doing is he was getting up in the middle of the night, going to the bathroom um, and taking his dog out in the middle of the night as well. And then coming back to bed, but it wasn't putting him back to sleep. It was just putting him as a nap. Mm. Now, when he updated it, deleted that sleep, put it in a different sleep, seven and a half, eight hours, whatever it was that he was truly getting his recovery scores all of a sudden went to 78, 81 and 69 or something like that. And so it almost gives you a little bit of unease knowing that, Hey, I can just change the number that I put in yeah. and it gives me a different output from something that we use as like a, an end all be all metric that we're like, Oh, we should change what we're doing here or there. So it starts to make your wheels turn. Mm -hmm. And if, if leaving this podcast, leaving this episode, if you if you take anything away, it's challenge everything, ask why for everything want to know what is going to make you more consistent. What is, what is the purpose? And don't just take it for face value. Want to understand why, want to know more information and want to get clear on what you're doing, why you're doing it and how it's going to affect you. Damn. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to take that. Yeah. I love it. Okay. I, there's so much I want to get covered here and we only have such a limited amount of time i want I, to talk I've about a, I've, I've got a, a couple extra minutes after so we, if we go over it's okay okay so i want to talk about your strength and conditioning time in the nhl kind of you talked about the energies that you bring to when you're going to work 
and you're selling ultimately you were selling the fact that you've got to get these guys into shape or keep them in a certain condition i'm curious from your standpoint what the most effective way was to get those guys to buy in because at times like you already mentioned a lot of those guys have talent but they don't necessarily have the consistency or the work ethic that's going to keep them at that peak performance level that they need to be to sustain a long-term career in the nhl i'd love for you to dive into number one at who the heck is like the biggest beast you've ever worked with? Because I'm sure having the list of teams you've worked with, you've worked some with some pretty incredible athletes. So I'd love for you to dive in, maybe give us some, some inside scoops on that. But further to that, what specific details made them so incredible? Was it that consistent work ethic that they brought to the table every single day? Was it the consistency of sleeping or what other factors? Yeah. So going back to the first question, which is buy-in. That's a, you hear that all the time. And if you follow Brett Bartholomew, it's not about how much information you know, but it's about how you communicate it. And I, I hate the saying, people don't know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Like that, that's BS uh, at the same time too, is it comes back to how do you communicate with somebody? We live in this era where the, the younger generation coming up, myself, and even now the people at, in leadership positions at, at larger companies, they want to know why. They want to know what they're doing and the purpose that it has. And so that's where for me and, and kind of with my company now and also as when I was in the NHL, that's what made it click. That's what made everyone, oh, I get it. Because you weren't just saying, hey guys, make sure you're getting uh, half your body weight in water, make sure you're drinking this amount, make sure you're getting, um, make sure you're using this night routine, make sure you're, uh, eating X, Y, or Z, make sure you're uh, doing this on the plane, make sure we're getting acclimated to our time change this way. You're not just telling them what to do. You're not just directing them and ordering them around. You're telling them, Hey, this is the science behind it. This is why we're doing this because you have to find out what their motivating factor is. What is their motivating factor for them? It's to perform well so that they can make more money. End of the day. Yeah. When, it, when contract time comes around, they want to make sure that everything they've done thus far has prepared them to sign that three, four, five year deal worth 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars so that ultimately they can do what they want and, and, and live the life they want. Well, on the business side, it's the exact same thing. They want to make sure that they ultimately can feel the best they can they can do it for as long as they can, and they can make as much money as they can. That's what it comes down to. Identify what that individual's key factor is. We work with some executives that money is not a motivating factor. They've made more money than and, and lost more money than I will ever see in my entire lifetime. And yet they just want to know, how can I be on this earth for 10 more years than I typically would if I didn't take this action. And why am I doing this stuff? Oh, okay. I get it. Perfect. Yeah. I'm going to implement it right now. That, that, that's the, and it becomes so simple. You don't have to check up on them. You don't have to babysit them. They go and take action because they want to see those changes and that's what motivates them. And that creates the buy-in. Mm. What motivates your individual? What motivates the person you're trying to talk to or, or help? And, Know your stuff. Yeah. Know your stuff because there's something else I said. If 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 you can't, if somebody can't convince somebody, they're going to confuse you. Mm. So if I was to come up to you and say, and I didn't know my stuff very well, and I was going to say, hey, you need to buy into this inner outer energy stuff, I would just throw a bunch of jargon around. I would talk in circles and then say, does that make sense? <laughs> Not really, but I mean, I guess you. I guess it makes sense. I, I, I guess he should know what he's doing. He's been here here and here and does this now i mean i guess so but know your stuff so well that you can explain the why you can explain the how and then you can explain the what but the key is the why that creates the buy-in under to and connect it to their motivating factor it comes down to just understanding the person i think and having that clear communication and an mm -hmm. open conversation around what their specific goals are what you're looking to do, how you're willing to change your lifestyle and ultimately to get the result that you want. 
Completely. Completely. Yeah. Cool. Now, in working with a lot of the, the athletes that, that I have and, and uh, the executives, uh, and I mean, some of the executives are just incredible in terms of like at the highest level, the people that are succeeding, the people that are generating a billion dollars in revenue a year are also some of the most fit, some of the most conscious, some of the most family oriented people you'll ever meet in your life. Like it's mm -hmm. absolutely incredible. Um, but when it comes to uh, hockey athletes specifically, I mean, Sean Corrali with the Bruins, uh, incredibly methodical, incredibly methodical about how he does things, how he goes about his business. Um, uh, Bobby Ryan, uh, yeah. incredibly focused on himself and development, willing to invest whatever it took to get to that next level. And it's no, no wonder that at 36 years old, he's doing some amazing things this year for the, the Detroit Red Wings. Um, mm -hmm. last year, comeback player of the year after going through what, everything that he had to go through personally. Um, Blake Coleman, the Tampa Bay Lightning. I mean, uh, right Iron Man. Polish, uh, absolutely incredible. Absolutely yeah. incredible. There's nothing that that guy can't do. Um, and I mean, a lot of people uh, don't know about like his, his cramping issues that, that he had that he went through in college and we helped create. And now obviously his nickname Pickles because pickle juice is what he drinks yeah. um, to keep that down. But I mean, the way in which that guy, again, goes about his business and balances family, balances his work and balances the mental side of the game. He has this, he has this mentality of inevitability, goes back to no matter what problem, no matter what he's facing, he can get through it. He can really drive through. Um, Ryan Getzlaff, another one, just like they put the work in, they put the time in and they're willing to dive into whatever it is that they need to. Um, and operate at that extremely high level. I'm curious from your standpoint, you brought up Mark andre Fleury uh, talking about the World Juniors. We've hosted a lot of goaltenders on this show. I myself was a goaltender, still am beer league level, I guess, whatever you call it. But um, because I think they have a unique athletic ability, from your point of view, have you noticed specific aspects of players, whether it's a forward defenseman, goaltender that really stand out? Like are goalies better in specific areas of athleticism or are there specific attributes that make a great forward, great defenseman, great goalie? I'm curious. So if, if we're getting like really technical and we're really getting down to like the, the scientific aspects of the way in which uh, muscle fiber typing and uh, cardiovascular system gifts and those types of things, then yes, there's definitely some changes, definitely some, some norms in which people will fall into. Uh, mm -hmm. Your most aerobically gifted athlete is, uh, is typically your goaltender. Um, mm. And uh, Interesting. somebody who obviously plays the whole 60 minutes, they've got a higher average elevated heart rate, but their heart rate isn't spiking. Um, as high as say a forward. Uh, now in terms of anaerobic power, um, so a wind gate test, your forwards are quite often going to be the most high in terms of anaerobic power, pure power and speed. Um, now anaerobic endurance, always your defenseman because they're playing longer shifts. They uh, are typically larger in in size have the ability to produce more power as it is genetically, but um, that's typically what we'll find. And obviously you have to train them slightly different than, uh -huh. um, than, 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 than others as well, because uh, as you're going along and, and looking at these attributes in which they possess, it, it's very easy to uh, just say, oh, I'm going to train a hockey player a certain way, but really diving down to the nitty gritties in which they need to, uh, truly operate at a different level, that's when things start to change. So when people ever chirp goaltenders, I'm going to refer them back to this episode. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, okay, a couple more questions. I want to know what your biggest misconception was, either relating it to now running your own business or moving from at Louisville, doing your strength and conditioning to moving to the NHL. What was that biggest misconception? You thought you were going to have gear, whatever, xyz handed to you when you got to that level or when you're owning a business and it's really not the case i'd love to know that's one of the things i always dive deep on on this show is 
identifying what people thought was going to happen and maybe what actually ended up happening? Yeah, so I think um, pro sports, sports in general, we put up on a pedestal and we see it as just being this, uh, we see the contracts guys throw out, we see the, um, uh, we see the, the money that's, that's going in and out through and everything that's put out for outdoor games or for uh, March Madness, which obviously is coming up and, and everything that's made financially. And your conception is, well, there's just unlimited money to be able to do everything. But in actuality, the money isn't there. You still have to get very creative. You still have to um, uh, choose the tools in which are going to give you the best results because you don't have the freedom to go have a $100,000 budget to be able to bring things in every year. You've maybe got five to 10. 10 to 20 on any given year to be able to do things to improve your, your, your players. Whereas at the business side, when working now in some of these executive corporations, mm -hmm. man, you're throwing around contracts in the six, seven figure mark without batting an eye. Wow. And so the, not without batting an eye, but it, it's they're they're, they're yeah. willing to do it. The funds are there. And so that I think is the big thing that I'm learning is that your best corporations, the people who, and even the best teams, even on the athletic side, they are willing to invest in their people because they know that profits, success, wins. I don't care how good the AI is. I don't care how good the app is. I don't care how good the technology is. Wins always come down to people. So that was, I think that's the biggest thing that I've, I'm continuing to learn as, as I go into it, go into this, um, is that it, it's the work that we're doing from that internet or inner and outer energy side is becoming more and more important and recognized through both the athletic and the, um, uh, the corporate side of, uh, of performance and and wins. I'm. I wonder if the NHL or pro sports are going to take notice at that because if you say that having worked for half a decade in the strength and conditioning within the NHL and notice that there's, you know, that budget for improving player performance isn't necessarily there compared to businesses. I wonder if they'll start spending more as they see maybe. All it takes is one team start doing it, and then you're going to see crazy results, and then everyone's going to jump on the bandwagon, right? Totally. And, and it's, there, there's some, there's some teams that are further ahead than others. Uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, at the same time, it's a hockey's behind the times a lot in, I mean, the, coming from even the, the, the collegiate setting, there's some colleges and some collegiate teams that I'll tell you what, it's incredible what they've put in and mm. You would not be surprised who they are. They're your Clemsons, they're your Alabamas, they're your Louisville's, they're mm -hmm. your UNCs, they're your USC. They're the they're the they're the places that are just churning out the the NFL's next best stars, the NBA's next best stars. The the I, I mean UK basketball, the amount that they put in for player development is noxious. Is is wild, but yeah. yet. It's it, why do you think every basketball player that has a, a chance to go to the NBA wants to go there? Mm -hmm. Why do you think if you want to go to the NFL, you want to go to Clemson or Alabama? Mm -hmm. Go take one step into their performance facility. Go take one step and look at their athletic website as to who they have on staff. The investment is there and thus the wins are also there. And that's what it all has to come back to is what are you investing in what type of technology, what kind of people are you investing in to help produce the results that you're looking for to be what the most consistent version of you day in and day out. Yeah. And I'm going to send this to Clemson and UK afterwards as a little uh, sponsorship note as the side. No, uh, Justin, we could talk all day on this topic. I sincerely appreciate you providing your time. The way we wrap up every episode on the athletes podcast is we ask our guest coach athlete, 
what their biggest piece of advice would be for the next generation of athletes. I would love for you to share what your biggest piece of advice would be. My biggest piece of advice is definitely to take more to, I mean, goes back to what my company is called is own it. Take responsibility in your own career. Take responsibility in owning what you put into your body, what you expose yourself to, what you read, who your mentors are, where you're spending your time. And don't just blindly trust the people who are put in front of you. Don't just blindly trust the coaches that are handed to you. Seek out the best, seek out information, seek out guidance, seek out mentorship, because that path to wherever it is that you're looking at going is full of winding, twisting turns and full of uh, intersecting pathways to people that you have no idea how they can or cannot impact your life, impact your career. And so the more interest that you take, the more responsibility you take upon yourself to be educated, to understand, and to be able to apply is going to really arm you to be, again, the best that you can be day in and day out and be more consistent. Justin Rothling Schaffer, this has been episode 73 of the Athletes Podcast. I sincerely appreciate, again, you sharing your knowledge, spending time with us, talking here. Uh, we'll have to do it again. Look forward to it. Maybe we'll go to Florida to do the next one, get some vitamin D in us. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much, David. I appreciate you. Thank you guys for watching the 73rd episode of the Athletes Podcast featuring Justin Rothling Schuper. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, would love if you subscribed. Freddie's here just to get you to subscribe, so we appreciate it. And we love hearing from you guys. If you liked the show, comment below your favorite part. And as always, we appreciate you tuning in to the 73rd episode of the Athletes Podcast. And I hope you have a great rest of your day, rest of your week, rest of your month. Whenever you're watching this, take care. Bye. Say bye, Fred.